Hi, philosophy fans. Today we're going to get a chance to talk about Socrates. Now, this is one philosopher whom you may have actually heard about. Before you started this philosophy class, maybe you hadn't heard of Friedrich Nietzsche or Jean-Paul Sartre or um, Soren Kierkegaard or any of these great Western philosophers. But Socrates, you may have heard of. Anyway, um, some of you know that he was executed. He was given poison to drink, and he met an untimely end, and his murder, as it were, state-sanctioned murder, has become the stuff of legends. Some of you may know that he was kind of a, a cantankerous sort, you know, somebody who would stop the common people of Athens, stop them in the middle of their endeavors as they were buying or shopping or coming into the downtown Acropolis to go worship at a deity or even at the Parthenon, the temple dedicated to Athena, uh, he would stop people and ask to have conversations with them. He'd say, hey, hey, stop there. Where are you going? Where are you going in such a hurry? I know that you're the poet Antius, or I know that you're the philosopher Antiphon, or I know that you are in, uh, you are one of the 12 in the assembly. Your name is Alcibiades. Um, he would stop people. And, you know, you have to imagine that the Athens is maybe a hundred thousand people. So even though that sounds like a ridiculous amount of, of of people, if you kind of think about it, the footprints of the footprint of Athens probably would fit, if you can do a little GPS in your head, between at the northern end Sweetwater Road in Chula Vista as you go into National City, to the southern end down to about Palomar, and then on the western end the five freeway and then the eastern end, the 805. So if you can think of a little strip of Chula Vista between the part that butts up to National City and the part of Chula Vista as it goes south to Palomar, you know, there's a the tram down there, and you can think about it being kind of narrow, kind of like the width of it would be from the 805 freeway to the 5 freeway, um, east and west. It's not that big a footprint, and so it would have been easy for the people in Athens to know who the tanner was. The tanner is the person who dyes clothes, or the butcher, or the candlestick maker, or the saddle maker, or the person who makes plows, or the stonemason, or the you know, or the you know, some guard or somebody in who, who's a general or an architect. You would have had a pretty good idea of who these people were in a town that wasn't that large. And so Socrates would have known. The people in his town, he certainly was well known because he used to hang around in the downtown marketplace. He never really had a formal job. He would have been like one of these people, if you can imagine it. Again, I'll use Chula Vista. We're not all from Chula Vista. But if you are if you were to think about Chula Vista on 3rd Avenue, right in the heart of the little shopping part of Chula Vista, if you can imagine somebody there on F Street and G, where the old Fuddruckers used to be, with a mag of, you know, with a... Um, you know, kind of like a, a megaphone and kind of like saying, hey there, stop. Have you converted to Jesus yet? You know, one of those kind of people that stands on the street corner and attracts attention. So if you lived in downtown Chula Vista, you would have known who Socrates was, you know, and he was, you know, he was a, quite a character. And he was kind of always surrounded by a group of adoring uh, disciples who really, really treasured him and valued him. Now, the people who made up Socrates' little group, his kind of posse, if you want to put it that way, were not people from the middle class, and they weren't people from the working class. Working class people have to work. They have to farm. They have to fish. They have to go to war. Um, they don't have the luxury for of an education. And certainly middle class people, they might have been in that group, but Actually, the people who surrounded Socrates, his disciples, people like Plato, people like Xenophon, people like Charmides, these were all, we know what their names are because, you know, we know them because Plato, one of Socrates' disciple, has left many dialogues uh, with the names of these people and we know something about their backgrounds. And so most of the disciples of Socrates were actually from the upper classes. And that makes sense, right? If you have leisure, if you have money, if your father has land, if your father has ships, like Socrates' father, uh, excuse me, like Plato's father had. His father was a ship owner. So you can imagine his father's wealthy. If you had ships in the Mediterranean, 
That's like having, you know, a big share of the internet. That's like owning Cisco. You know, that's the internet. That's how things get moved. And that's how trade happens in the Mediterranean world. Not by donkey, not by horseback, but by sea. The Mediterranean is the, is the highway. And, uh, and Plato's father had ships. And so Plato just being one of those disciples, other, other of the disciples had uh, access to money and leisure. That's why they would have been able to court the services of somebody like Socrates because they weren't tied to making money. They already had money. And um, we'll come back to that point in a minute. So Socrates' disciples were generally from the upper class. They had the money and the leisure to be able to consider esoteric things like philosophy. Anyway, um, so Socrates, a very interesting person. He, as a young man, he had fought against the Persians. If you guys, most people have seen the movie uh, The 300, which was a little bit earlier uh, period of Greek history, but the Persians always had their ambitions on um, the Greek peninsula. And uh, as a young man, Socrates fought in one of those invasions of uh, the Persians and was successful at repelling them. Um, so Socrates had been a soldier in his young life. He didn't come from money. His uh, mother was a midwife. That was a woman who basically helps uh, mothers to be have their children. And Socrates knew something about being a midwife. He actually knew how to help women have children, and he was a stonemason. So he had kind of like vocational type jobs. He certainly wasn't this academic who went to, you know, who had access to great teachers and tutors. That wasn't true. Socrates was a working class person. Uh, there's an interesting story. We, lo we know this from Plato about how he got his vocation as a philosopher. Um, a friend of his, Chirophon, went to um, make a pilgrimage to Delphi. If you were a good Greek, you would seek counsel by going on a pilgrimage or asking somebody to go on a pilgrimage and to inquire of the oracle, this priest or priestess who would go into the temple, breathe the fumes that would come up from the ground. Uh, they had this little crack in the floor of the temple. It's kind of interesting. They left a crack in the floor and through this floor, the fumes would come up, earth fumes, kind of sulfuric fumes, which are not very pleasant. But the priest would go into the temple, breathe these fumes, and supposedly get inspired by the god uh, Apollo. And they would come out of the temple and then give you your fortune telling. So you'd go in and ask the, the priest or the priestess, whoever was the priest or priestess during that period of time, hey, would you go in there and would you tell me, is my wife being faithful to me? Or um, am I going to come into my father's inheritance? Or am I going to become rich? And the priest or priestess would go in, do their breathing fumes, come back out and tell you, you know, sell your cow and buy this. <laughs> you know, it just give you some kind of a oracle that would give you your fortune. And Chirophon goes to Delphi, asks the priestess, we even know her name, Pythia, and she goes in, breathes the fumes from the floor and comes back and says, there is no one wiser than Socrates. Chirophon comes back from the pilgrimage from Delphi, goes back to Athens, maybe a two-week walk on a pilgrimage. You know, you take food and clothing and you go on this pilgrimage. He came back to Athens and tells Socrates, hey, the priest has told me no one is wiser than you. And Socrates would think, that's kind of crazy. I don't have much reputation for being this learned man. And he goes off through Athens and tries to find out, well, what could the oracle, what could the priestess be meaning by the fact that I'm supposed to be the most intelligent or the wisest man. So he goes and he has a conversation with a poet and with a politician and with a musician. We, we know about this through Plato's writings. And he asks them, well, can you tell me, to the poet, can you tell me what the nature of love is? And to the politician, can you tell me what the nature of politics are? And to the musician, would you please tell us what the muse is telling you? And none of these people give him answers that are sufficient. And he comes to this conclusion that Maybe what the priestess was trying to tell him, maybe what the god Apollo was trying to tell Socrates was that he was wise because he knew nothing, because he admitted that he knew nothing. And so from that moment, that kind of launches Socrates' philosophical career. And from that point, 
he um, begins this kind of process. We, we know this now as the Socratic method, the Socratic dialogue, in which he'll stop somebody in the streets of Athens and then kind of goes and has a, a, a conversation with them. Hey, you're supposed to be this learned individual. Why don't you tell me what beauty is? Why don't you tell me what love is? You're a poet. Uh, why don't you, politician, why don't you tell me what justice is? And he has these conversations, and these conversations have been recorded in many, many books that Plato wrote. Plato, Socrates' disciple. Socrates never wrote anything. He's kind of like Jesus and like Buddha. They, nef they left no record of their writings. Disciples of theirs, disciples of Socrates, disciples of Buddha, disciples of Jesus, wrote down their words. Those three figures never wrote anything down. Socrates never wrote anything down. But we know a lot about what Socrates said through his disciple, a very gifted writer named Plato. Plato was only about 18 years old when he met and fell under the spell of Socrates. And he thought, God, the way that Socrates interviews people and the way that he's able to kind of get, you know, the answer that he's looking for from these politicians or from these poets, or from these other people that, you know, supposedly have knowledge. Uh, Plato just revered Socrates as this, you know, gifted man that uh, who had been sent to Athens by the gods. Anyway, so that's the gist that we get. So Socrates, so here he is at around the age of 40, starting kind of a new career. He was earlier a soldier and a midwife, and he was a stonemason. A stonemason in Spanish, we call it an albañil, somebody who lays stone, brick, makes a patio wall, can make a room addition for you. It's all made out of stone. They didn't really work, work with wood that much. Stonemason, that's what Socrates did. But now at the age of 40, with this kind of invocation of the gods, he starts his career as a philosopher, and he's having conversations with people in the street, you know, to try to find out these great definitions that we all throughout the history of philosophy have all wanted to know. What were the things that Socrates wanted to investigate? I guess if you were writing down notes during this lecture, this might be one of those moments where you say, oh, okay, this is what Orozco said that Socrates was really interested in doing. Socrates was really interesting in, interested in finding the definitions for the great philosophical ideas that have always existed through time the great philosophical ideas. What is truth? What is goodness? What is evil? What is justice? Uh, what is beauty? What is um, virtue? All of those kind of things. What's good government? What is the best life possible? You notice how those are all kind of great transcendental questions in philosophy. They go back to that first lecture or the first couple of lectures that I gave you in this class about that philosophy studies the universal questions of life and existence. And certainly Socrates was interested in the universal questions of life and existence. What is truth? What is beauty? What is good? What is evil? What is justice? All of those questions. And he would have conversation after conversation with people. Imagine somebody on Third Avenue in Chula Vista with his megaphone saying, have you found Jesus yet? But instead of the Jesus, you know, approach, it was, have you investigated this? You're supposed to be a wise person. Why don't you tell me what you know? And he would just try to get the answer from that person. He never really had his own definition. He was trying to ask you to try to give you so that you could give him the definition. And he would kind of subject that to, to question and inquiry. He considered himself a midwife of ideas. He actually used that expression a couple of times in, in Plato's writing. He goes, consider me a midwife. I help people birth their ideas. He called himself a midwife of ideas. I hope you're getting that impression that midwives back in the day are people that help women have babies. So he was the midwife of ideas. He helped you birth your idea. Um, so anyway, but at the time of Socrates, at the time of Socrates, there was a group of philosophers that were also making their living in Athens and throughout the Greek world. Socrates wasn't the only philosopher. Remember, Socrates is now following the period of the pre-Socratics. We'd already looked at, you know, Heraclitus and Parmenides and 
Anaximander and Anaximenes and Thales. We didn't examine all of them, but you know we've already gone past that period of the pre-Socratics. So philosophers are well known in the Greek world. They are well known in Athens, and certainly Socrates wasn't the first. He's there was 130 years of philosophical inquiry before Socrates ever appeared on the stage. Right, 130 years. This mo this movement of philosophy is already occurred in the Greek world, and it's very strong in Athens. Athens is a cosmopolitan city. There's cosmopolitan city, so uh, it's very built up. It's got architecture. It's got temples. It's got a courthouse. Um, it's got uh, a big marketplace. It's It's got uh, builders and, and sculptors and uh, designers and engineers. It's got people who can uh, are naval people and merchants and you know it's a very cosmopolitan city think of you know what san francisco or los, An los angeles would be port cities that um you know have a naval uh, you know a maritime influence in other words there's a lot of import export going on there and there's people that are involved in commerce and in design and in building and in technology they actually have technology they know how to raise buildings and design buildings and sculpt human anatomy and you know mathematics uh, this was a very cosmopolitan city, and they had cosmopolitan thinkers. So within the city of Athens and in the Greek world were a group of philosophers called the Sophists. Sophists, S-O-P-H-I-S-T-S, -S -S, the Sophists. It comes from a Greek word, sophos, meaning wisdom. So Socrates wasn't the only person in Athens or in the Greek world plying their trade of knowledge to somebody who could pay for it. So a sophist, just like Socrates, if you could pay that person, if you could pay the sophist, they would teach you astronomy, what you know, the, the astronomy that they understood at the time, uh, mathematics, they could teach you athletics, they could teach you musical theory, uh, they could teach you geometry, uh, rhetoric and argumentation, and certainly philosophy. So a sophist would have been somebody like a, a Kumon tutor, you know, somebody who can, you can invite to your home or you could go to their little, you know, whatever little office they might have had. Of course, they didn't have offices, but, you know, maybe a room or their home and you could go to and pay them for instruction. Poor people weren't paying for instruction. It had to be somebody who paid money. Socrates didn't really, he had a reputation of not wanting to take money, but certainly other philosophers, you had to pay them for their services. So they could train you in the art of public speaking or in legal matters or in uh, persuasion um, or in argumentation or in mathematics, geometry. You could pay somebody. And the sophists, the wise people, sophos, wisdom, these people, you could you could pay them for um, academic training, if you will. And there was, a, and but they had a reputation. Here's another little notation that you can make. The sophists in general, had a reputation as uh, as being a group of philosophers that didn't believe that there was anything absolute. Truth was not absolute. Uh, goodness was not absolute. In other words, everything was a matter of public opinion. It could change over time. And so, whereas you and I might feel, you and I, and certainly Socrates, might feel that there are things that are truth and they've been established, and they won't change over time. There are things that are objectively true. Mathematics has a lot of objectively true equations and theorems. Um, you know, for instance, the one that we probably all recognize, you know, back from geometry days, the Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It gives you the, hypo the hypotenuse of a right angle. Well, I'm not going to bring up geometry right now, but that was true back in the days of Euclid and Pythagoras 2,600 years ago. And it's also true today. What, what the Greeks were teaching in terms of radius and circumference and diameter and pi, all of those things are still true today. And so Socrates would have been somebody who believed in objective truth, and objective truth doesn't change. It doesn't change in the past, and it won't change into the future. But the sophists... This other group of philosophers in and around Athens, they didn't really believe that truth was eternal. In other words, everything that we consider to be knowledge 
would one day be disproven and some new theory would come into place. Now that rankled uh, Socrates. He didn't like that. He, he believed that there were things that once established, they would always be eternally true, just like in mathematics. Once you've established a mathematical theorem, it's always going to be true. Well, the sophists didn't really believe that. So let's get into, before we kind of finish with Socrates, let's get into a little bit about who his opponents were in this philosophical debate at that particular time, kind of Socrates on one side and the sophists on the other. So the sophists, I'm, I'm, I'm holding up a, a, a biology book that was in our Southwestern College library back before COVID days, right, when you can go into the library. So this little biology book I found, um, it was published like around, let's say, I, I want to say like 2018, pretty recent. Let me see when it was. I can't find it in here, but it's a it's a fairly recent book. It was in our it was in our bookstore, one of the most recent versions of a biology textbook in our bookstore back before COVID days. But if you look at this biology textbook, I want you to do this little mind experiment with me. Do you think that the biology information that we have in this textbook, right? Because they'll have things on, you know, plant life and spores and um, the cell, remember, osmosis and, uh, you know, uh, photosynthesis and the mitochondria and all those little, the Dardanelles, all those little things that you had to remember in biology. Maybe you like that stuff and maybe you didn't, but, you know, all that stuff that you have to learn in biology. A sophist would say everything that you're learning in this book will one day not be factual. So you're kind of thinking, well, what the hell am I in class for? What the, why am I even studying for if knowledge is just going to be overturned and it's not going to be true anymore? And yet that's exactly what the sophists are saying. They were saying it back in the day of Socrates. They were saying everything that we teach today, whether it was back in Socrates' day or whether we're teaching it at Southwestern College today in a biology class or in a sociology class, or in an anthropology class, or in a psychology class, or in a history class. Everything that they were teaching back in the day of Socrates and the Sophists, and everything that we were teaching in the Middle Ages, and everything that they've taught in the history of the world, east or west, north or south, everything that has been taught according to the Sophists will one day be overturned, because there is no truth. There is no absolute truth. Everything that we teach is partial, and incomplete and in unsubstantial. It doesn't stand the test of time. This book, this biology textbook from 2018, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we're going to be laughing at the stuff that was in this book and say, they actually believed in photosynthesis, y'all. Oh my God, these people were backwards, man. Imagine people 100 years from now looking at our chemistry in 2021 looking at our chemistry textbooks, our anthropology textbooks, and looking at us as if we were primitives because, the, because they're, they would be saying in you know 100 years from now, God, those people were really primitive. We have nanotechnology now. We do surgery through little you know viruses. We inject the virus in you and the virus does the surgery. I mean, you know, stem cells and, you know, like, you know, organ replacement and arm replacement. They can replace the optics of your, I mean, in the future, it'll be like Star Wars, you know, where you can get a new hand that's completely digitalized and it looks completely like human flesh. Remember, all science fiction is basically a prediction of what's going to happen in the future. But um, they're, they're going to look at our technology and our learning and, and call us absolutely primitive. And what are the sophists saying? They're saying that's because there is no such thing as truth. The only thing that we teach in school is the latest opinion. But remember, opinion is not truth. And then let's not even get into goodness, right? Truth is like the conceptual things that we believe in the mind. What about ethics, good and evil? The sophists were just as radical, not only in terms of objective intellectual truth, they were also very, very uh, skeptical about the ability of being able to define good and evil. 
Do you understand what I mean? In other words, on both those intellectual approaches, whether we're talking about truth or whether we're talking about goodness, truth or goodness, both of those will never have any absolute definitions of those things because they always change over time. There is no absolute truth or goodness. That's what the sophists were saying. Did you all write that down? The sophists don't believe in absolute truth. They don't believe in that. It all changes over time. Now, Socrates, when he heard, you know, the teachings of Antiphon and Pyro and, and Gorgias and uh, um, Thucyd, not Thucydides, but um, there was a other, uh, his name will come to me. Uh, there's a, a good number of people that were sophists. Um, when he heard their theories, he was like thinking, oh my God, these people are dangerous. These people are dangerous because they're going to get people to believe that there's no such thing as an absolute truth on any level, mathematics or science or, you know, ethics, conduct, nothing is true. So Socrates spent most of his adult life trying to disprove the allegations of the sophists. So when he was engaging with people in the streets, I want you to think, why was somebody so motivated in finding definitions for why was why was why was some dude so motivated to stop people in the street and have conversations with them? You have to understand the motivation for Socrates was this group of philosophers with whom he was kind of like in a intellectual debate with. In other words, these were his philosophical opponents. The the sophists were his philosophical opponents, and so he wanted to find people who could help him get the definitions that he wanted so that he could go back to the sophists and argue against them and say, nope, I know what the definition of justice is. The definition of justice is to render to each individual that which is due. That's, a, that's kind of a definition that he came up with. The, the definition of goodness is that which improves on human nature. So, you know, he did try to come up with definitions for these definitions. Are they the best definitions of all time? Can they be disproven? Can they be argued against? Yeah, unfortunately, the subject matter that Socrates is looking at, just like any of the subject matter in philosophy, can always be subject to interpretation. So while he's spending this huge amount of his adult life trying to get definitions from people, writers, poets, musicians, politicians. He's spending his adult life trying to get these definitions so he can argue against the sophists who don't believe that there's anything eternally true or anything absolutely objective. He wants these definitions to fight against his opponents. Can he get those definitions? Did he ever get those definitions? Well, he certainly came up with some pretty good definitions, but in the end, Socrates says, I only know that I know nothing. But he was firm in the belief that there could be a definition that would satisfy the debate for all time. In other words, if people could just get to the essence of justice, we would have a definition that could never be repudiated. It would be an absolute definition of justice, just like an absolute definition of geometry or some other you know, uh, equation. It would never change. It would be a formula that would never change. Did he ever get that? Well, if you if you re stay in this module on Socrates, you'll see a reading uh, that I included in the module. It's called the Euthyphro. Weird name, huh? Euthyphro. If you look at that um, reading, it's about a four-page reading that I've included in this link of this week dealing with Socrates. Euthyphro, uh, also written by... Plato. Uh, Euthyphro is a person who Socrates had this conversation with because Euthyphro is taking his father uh, to the court because he, he wants to put his father on trial for murdering a servant, a slave. Anyway, that's, there's a, I don't want to get into a long dialogue of that, but Plato tells us that one day Socrates met Euthyphro on the courthouse steps Socrates was going to the courthouse because he was had that he he was about to be indicted for corrupting the youth of Athens. So that's why he was going up the courthouse steps. 
but he meets Euthyphro, and Euthyphro is this person who's taking his father to court because Euthyphro feels his father has murdered somebody unjustly. His father had killed a slave, and Euthyphro said, I don't care if he's my father, he did something wrong. Well, when Socrates hears why Euthyphro is going to the court, you know he's all over that one, man. He goes, man, you're going to take your father to court? Dang, man, you must really be a learned person for you to... Uh, for you to, you know, take your father to court, you must know what right and wrong is. Man, I'm, you got to tell me this. So they go into this long debate to try to find out what wrong, right and wrong is. And you can see kind of Socrates in action trying to help Euthyphro give him this definition that he wants. Like, what is goodness, man? You must know. You're going to take your father to court. You, you must know this person. You must know these things. And Euthyphro and him kind of knock it around back and forth. At the end of the dialogue, as you will see, Socrates didn't really get the definition he wanted. Euthyphro kind of said, dude, I got to run. I got to bounce. I'm out of here. And they never really got to the definition. Uh, but you can at least see in that little dialogue that I included in this module for this week, you can see Socrates in action trying to go back and forth with uh, Euthyphro to kind of find a definition. Man, tell me what's right. Tell me what's good. Tell me what's pious as opposed to being unpious, meaning pious meaning good, un impious meaning evil. Tell me what good is, man, and you can see Socrates in action. So anyway, that's kind of Socrates' life in a nutshell. He's a tutor, as it were. He's a private tutor. He tutors kind of the wealthy elements of Athenian society, and uh, he didn't hang around with people who were poor. They didn't really give him money. But in a sense, he kind of benefited from by being around wealthy people. If you're around wealthy people, when they eat, you're going to eat. When they travel, you're going to travel. So Socrates, even though he didn't collect money, he was living, you know, he had benefits from, you know, tutoring a very upper class group of people. Um, like I said, you know, Plato's father was a ship owner and, you know, he's wealthy, super wealthy. Um, anyway, now, something happened during... Socrates, right when he's in his mid-40s, a war breaks out in Athens. And the war is a very, very famous war in world history. The, it's a civil war, and it's a war between Athens, a very cosmopolitan, excuse me, I was kind of see the camera backward. You'll hear me say that a lot of time. So Athens is on one end of that war, very cosmopolitan city with politicians and architects and builders and designers and mathematicians. And they fought Sparta. Sparta was kind of a military town, a, a military state in southern Greece. And these two cities knuckled up and it turned into about a 26-year war where um, Athens really suffered from having taken on the Spartans. As you guys know, even if you saw the movie 300, you'll know that the Spartans were incredible warriors and uh, not to be trifled with. And so... Uh, the, the, backdrop, the backdrop of Socrates' life as he's in Athens, as he's going around talking to people and getting, getting information and having these philosophical debates, right outside the walls of Athens, there's a war going on. The Spartans are surrounding the city. It's kind of, really, it's kind of weird because you never really see that too much in Plato's writings, but a lot of Plato's writings are happening during a time in which Athens, Socrates' city, is under siege by the Spartans who were just right outside their walls. It's kind of crazy because it was a civil war going on. The thing that protected Athens was that it had high walls and the Spartans really couldn't get in. And the and this Athenian navy used to supply the city by ship. The Spartans didn't really have a navy to speak of. And so the Athenians were able to get resupplied through a through a, a, a harbor that brought the, the grain and the rice and the things that the Athenians needed. But in the meantime, the, outside of Athens, the city was surrounded. But the sea enabled the Athenians to maintain, you know, the, the city from going into, you know, siege, a, a complete, you know, implosion. Uh, and that war went on for 26 years. And the in, so anyway, there's this, it's this incredible story of Athens fighting against Sparta at the, and inside the walls, you know, city life is kind of going on uh, as usual. And Socrates is inside those city walls carrying on and having philosophical debates, but the city is at war. 
It's kind of crazy. It's called the Peloponnesian War, and we know all about it from Thucydides, a historian, an Athenian historian who lived in the city, and he wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, the 26-year war. Well, several of Socrates' students um, were actually uh, advocates of Sparta, and they got involved in a takeover attempt. Spartans actually, a couple of years before Socrates' life ended, I, I should have said at the very beginning that the life of Socrates was from 427, uh, uh, from, what was it, 469 to 399. He was 70 years old. I'll give you a little, um, you know, kind of chronology of his life again. But, um, you know, right near the end of Socrates' life, two of Socrates' students, and we know their names, we know their names, uh, Cretius and Alcibiades, two of Socrates' students got involved in an overthrow attempt of the Athenian democracy, and they succeeded in 404, just a couple of years before Socrates' execution. And they conspired with Spartans who broke into the city and took over the city. Now, how can a small group of Spartans enter a city and take over a city? Well, that was kind of interesting because most of the Athenian military was fighting in the, in the Peloponnesian War outside the gates of, of Athens. And so Athens on the inside didn't have that strong of a military presence. And so it was easy for a group of Spartans to infiltrate into a city and to take over the city. And that's happened several times in history. If you think about it, Cortes, Hernán Cortes, with 200 men, took over uh, Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, in 1517 or so, in the, the, the Mexican conquest or the conquest of Mexico by Spain. So with 200 soldiers, he took over a city, you know, of, of over several million uh, Aztecs. Uh, it happened also in the Greek War, in the Trojan War, where a small group of... of uh, of Greek warriors went into a, a horse, you know, supposedly this is not only mythology, but in fact true. And the, in the belly of the horse, they went into the walls of Troy and opened the gates. And, and actually, that's how Troy was defeated. And so it's not without precedent that a small group of warriors had infiltrated a city and then led to the takeover of the city. And I'm sure there's other examples of a small group uh, you know, cutting off telecommunications and sabotaging and then helping the city to be overrun. And that's exactly what happened. So two of Socrates' students were involved in a takeover attempt and they took over the city of Athens. It was right near the end of the war for a period of eight months. And during the eight months that um, Alcibiades and, and Cretius, along with another group, they were called the, the Group of the Thirty, a, a group of 30 tyrants kind of basically took over the city of Athens and they murdered many Athenian uh, citizens with the help of Spartan muscle, you know, kind of Spartan backup gangsters, basically. I mean, to use a kind of a modern term on it. But um, the Spartan military kind of helped these people maintain power. So they took over power from the Athenian democracy. And they, they kind of kept the city uh, under siege for about a period of eight months, and they killed about 1,500 Athenians during that time. They raped women, took property, kind of living, you know, thug life, uh, if, if you want to think about it from that point of view. They were kind of went gangster and, and took over the city. You would think that Socrates' students, who had been exposed to philosophy and to, and to virtue and to training by Socrates, you would think that if they took over the city, that they would be a little bit more moderate and philosophical and just. Nah, that didn't happen. In fact, you know, Cretius and Alcibiades, they just kind of run, they just kind of, you know, ran madhouse over the Athenian democracy for eight months. As the war came to an end, as, a war, as the war came to an end, um, soldiers started to return back to Athens and the, the group of the 30, along with the Spartan military, the small military contingent that helped them hold the city, they were all overrun, and they all galloped out of town, and they were all hunted down to the last man. Cretius, who was uh, uh, Plato's cousin, was killed, and Alcibiades uh, was his, was, uh, uh, excuse me, Cretius was his uncle, Plato's uncle, and uh, Alcibiades was his cousin. So it's kind of interesting that Plato had two family members 
that were involved in a takeover attempt of Athens. Not only a takeover attempt, they actually did take the city over and they kind of like bloodied the city badly. It was a very bad moment in Athenian history. If you think about the capital riots that we just had back in January, on January 6th, if you kind of look at like political turmoil and social turmoil when you're thinking, oh man, there's an overthrow attempt going on. Well, that's basically what happened in Athens back in the day. I'm, I'm glad I kind of thought about that so that you can think about this in real terms. I mean, two of Socrates' students opened the gates for this Spartan group to come over, and they did take over the city. It, it would be as if the, the pro-Trump rioters actually did take over the capital and then ran the city for eight months. So that's what happened in Athens. And uh, they did a very bloody, a very bloody revolution, but it only lasted for about eight months until members of the Athenian navy and army made their way back into the city and basically overthrew uh, this group that had taken over the city. And that really darkened the name of Socrates because um, after these people were hunted down, remember, there's a military justice was taking place, just like, you know, Trump, a lot of the Trump supporters right now, the FBI is going after them big time, you know, whether they were police elements involved or capital police elements that were involved in that, uh, in that insurrection back in January, um, they're being hunted down, right? They're being traced. That's what the Athenian, once the Athenian government kind of restored itself, they started to track these people down too. And so in 399, took a couple of, remember, this was 404, a couple of years before Socrates' trial, they, uh, they pulled Socrates aside and they said, you know what, we want you to answer for what your students did. Because you must have been saying something that was corrupting the youth. That's, that's the charge that they brought against Socrates. You're corrupting the youth of, uh, of the city. There was another charge too, a second charge that was disbelief in the gods. But the main charge was corrupting the youth. What was the Athenian government hinting at when they were saying corrupting the youth? Was it because he was teaching philosophy? No. There's all kinds of philosophy being taught in Athens. That wasn't the charge. There was all kinds of philosophical teaching going on in Athens. It wasn't because because Socrates was a teacher. There's plenty of philosophy teachers and all kind and some who didn't believe in the gods at all. So it wasn't because of Socrates being a philosopher. It was because of Socrates' actions that led two of his students to take over the city. That's why they were interested in, in bringing Socrates to trial. That's what the charge corrupting the youth meant. Two of his students got involved in an overthrow attempt just a few years before the trial. It took a couple of years for the city, you know, you can ask, well, why didn't they, why didn't they bring Socrates to trial right away? Hey, the city had just been in a 26-year war against Sparta. They still had, I'm sorry, there's a huge light change here coming through. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I hope I'm not whiting you guys all out. Um, so the city was still in chaos of, from a civil war and also from an insurrection attempt, a revolution that had, that had taken place in the city. So the city, the city's you know, institutions, like the law institutions, weren't functioning. It took a couple of years later, in the year 399, before Socrates was finally put on trial. And they wanted to find out what was he doing in corrupting the youth. Now, during that trial, it's kind of interesting, there was a book written by a guy named, let me see if I can not get it. There's a book written uh, by a guy named I.F. Stone. Can you see this? This book was given to me by a history professor who retired a couple of years ago, Barry Horlor, very learned person. He said, hey man, you teach philosophy. Have you ever heard of I.F. Stone's book, The Trial of Socrates? And I go, well, I've never looked at the trial aspect of it. I know Socrates' is, you know, political and philosophical theory, but I've never really looked at the actual trial. He goes, I used to read about him, and this investigative journalist really went back and tried to find all this forensic evidence in terms of why they actually brought Socrates to trial. And that's when I learned, oh man, I didn't realize that Socrates had actually, you know, gotten involved in some politics and that he was, you know, he was very um, catering to the wealthier ambitions of, of upper crust 
Athenian philosophy. You would think that Socrates would have been teaching working class people. I mean, Socrates, right? The man of the people. Well, actually, Socrates was actually hanging around with very wealthy, affluent people. And some of these affluent people, like Plato, like Xenophon and Charmides and, and Alcibiades and Creatus, they actually didn't like democracy all that much. They thought democracy was kind of like uh, very subject to uh, um, propaganda and that people weren't very intelligent. You know, the masses of the people weren't very intelligent. And so Socrates kind of felt that this group of kind of aristocratic youth, they were the ones that should be the intelligentsia of the city. And if anybody should be running the city, it should be a small, someone from that small group of a philosophical cadre of, of students, it should be somebody from those inner group to rise up to be like the philosopher king of the city. Democracy is too messy, too disorganized, and too subject to lobbyists and political persuasion. It should be somebody with a philosophy background, somebody who's beyond politics that should be running the city. And so Socrates, in a sense, if, if, if you look at the writings of I.F. Stone, Socrates was a bit of an elitist because he certainly wasn't teaching the working class people. He was teaching the sons of aristocrats, you know, and people. And when they looked at what was happening in Athens, they didn't like it because they felt like too many of the normal working class people in, in Athens could get access to political power. And why should somebody who had a butcher shop be running the city? They felt that they were the, the children of privilege and they should be running the city or they should have influence in the city. After all, they were the ones who had the most leisure and culture and money and you know, aristocracy and everything like that. So, you know, that that kind of like prejudice goes on to, to this day, right? Who usually goes into Congress and into the Senate? Working class people or people who already have access to power because of money and affluence and influence, right? It's usually wealthy people who go into politics. There's always some grassroots person who makes it into politics, but most people go into politics because they're already hugely connected. Think about Sarah Jacobs, you know, the, the daughter who just got elected into Congress, you know, her father, Erwin Jacobs, who's the, you know, the developer of, you know, the microchips and stuff like that, uh, you know, for Qualcomm. So, you know, how did she get in office? She, uh, you know, her father was already, uh, you know, super hooked up billionaire. And that's usually what happens in politics. And, and certainly in the time of Plato and in Socrates, wealthy people were kind of feeling pushed out by this new democratic thing that was happening in Athens in which common people could hold political office. Well, the wealthy people were kind of feeling, why should we, why should we give up our influence to let common people run the city? Can you kind of hear that that's, that kind of debate between the aristocracy and the working class? That's almost always been going on in history. Who should run the city? I mean, the framers of the American Constitution and the, you know, the, frame, you know, the founding fathers, they were aristocrats. They certainly didn't think that farmers should be running the 13 colonies. They felt like, you know, the, the landed aristocracy with access to wealth and education, to European training, they should be the framers of the Constitution. That's happened throughout history, you know, where wealthy people feel entitled to political power. And that happened back in the day of Socrates. And uh, Socrates was actually most of the people that he was trained. I'm sorry if it's repetitious, but I'm hoping that as you hear this, you can kind of hear, man, that stuff happens today. Wealthy people want to have influence. They want to have access to political power, right? Because wealthy people want to see economics develop and they want to see their privileged class continue to maintain their privileged status, right? Uh, that makes sense. Um, so, Socrates was catering to a wealthier group of people. And I have Stone really, really gets into that. It's a brilliant book. And, and there's actually, I have a, an extra credit assignment that's based on I have Stone. And you can look into the trial. But let me finish by saying during the trial, when they said, Socrates, we find you, we, we accuse you of corrupting the youth of Athens. You know, you're, you're putting into their ideas their head, anti-democratic ideas. Socrates acted very boastfully at his trial. He, he basically said, man, if you guys are going to, you know, and uh, so anyway, he gave his trial and he acted very boastfully during the trial. He said, I have been sent by the God Apollo to be your, to be a mouthpiece of wisdom for you. 
And they were going, man, in Spanish we say, bájale, bájale. You know, kind of lower the rhetoric there a little bit, bro. You're, you're kind of like, you're sounding too uppity. Um, and so Socrates acted very boastful during the trial, so much so that when his disciples who were in the audience listening, they were kind of thinking, damn, uh, he better tone that down a little bit. These people are pissed. There was 1,500 people killed just a few years earlier by two of your disciples. You know, so there was some anger in the city of Athens directed toward, if not Socrates directly, at least towards his teachings. And so, uh, you know, and here's Socrates acting all boastfully. Well, anyway, there was 500 jurors, 500, 500 jurors, and they, and they, they decided, I think it was like 280 for conviction, guilty of corrupting the youth, 220 for acquittal. So it wasn't that crazy of a vote. In term 280 and conviction, 220 said not guilty. Um, and so when they found him guilty, the Athenian court said to Socrates, we find you guilty of corrupting the youth. What penalty do you give to yourself? Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like that unenlightened. That sounds pretty enlightened. Imagine, imagine a jury trial in the United States finding you guilty and then saying, well, we find you guilty of corruption or embezzlement or fraud or whatever. What penalty do you want to give to yourself? I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound that crazy. I mean, what was Socrates so pissed off about Athenian government? The Athenian trial system sounded pretty progressive. You know, what trial do you want to give to yourself? And so um, Socrates could have come up at that point with some kind of stuff. You know, hey, man, I'll censor myself for a year or two. I'll go into retirement. You know, I'll kind of, I won't publish anything. I'll kind of keep a low profile. I'll pay a penalty. He could have come up with any of that stuff. And he said, uh, according to I.F. Stone, we know this. Uh, and we know this from the writings of uh, Xenophon, who was at the trial. And he was one of Socrates' disciples. He also wrote about the trial. He wrote his own apology. Uh, he wrote about the, tr the actual trial, not only Plato, but another disciple. And we know about the vote, and we know what Socrates said. He said, I offer one penny. At that time, a penny was called the mina, M-I-N-A, a mina. Kind of like, you know, if you, got, you want to kind of flip a coin. He, he offered a penny. In other words, he's saying, man, this is a bullshit conviction. I offer you a penny. I want to be given a free meal for the rest of my life in the Pratanium, meaning in the downtown Acropolis, Socrates said, my penalty should be that you give me a free meal for the rest of my life in downtown. Just to give you an idea of what that meant, if you won the Olympic Games, if you were an Olympic game winner, like if you won the discus throw or the javelin throw or Greco wrestling or, you know, one of the running events, you know, the decathlon, you know, those original, there was 10 original Olympic game events, not like 1,500 like they have now with twirling and, you know, golf and softball and, you know, underwater diving. And I mean, they just every single thing in the world is in the Olympics now. But back then, there was only 10 events. And if you won, if you were the Olympic gold medal winner of an Olympic event that they had every four years, if you won an Olympic event, you would be given a meal for one year in the downtown Acropolis. In other words, you could be underneath a little tent and they would be bringing you a meal. You would have a laurel wreath in your hair indicating that you were the gold medal winner. In other words, you're LeBron taking a meal downtown and everybody in LA can come down to you and say, LeBron, can I have your autograph? You know, you know, where you were kind of like putting yourself out there in public if you were the Olympic winner. And Socrates said, okay, I find myself one penny. I want to be given a free meal for the rest of my life in the Pratanium, meaning the downtown Acropolis, and I want a statue in my honor. So what is Socrates basically saying by those three suggestions of a penalty? In other words, this is what he was suggesting should be his penalty, make a statue in my honor. What is he basically saying to the 500 people in the jury? He's basically flipping them the finger and saying, this is a bullshit conviction. Well, in Athens... In the court, in the Athenian court, if they didn't like your counter penalty, if they found you guilty and they gave you a chance to offer a penalty, if they didn't like your penalty, they could offer a counter penalty. Well, after they heard Socrates' penalty, they offered a counter penalty. They huddled up the 500 people. They're going to hear the crowd. Death. 
And they said, Socrates, we heard your count, your penalty. Our counter penalty, since we didn't like what you offered, is going to be death. And Socrates basically kind of went, cool. So they throw him in prison. And he's in prison for a month. You would think, well, why wouldn't they execute him right away? Why wouldn't they execute him right away? Well, in Athens, if you were going to be executed, you had to wait for a complete new cycle of a full moon. So I guess he was found guilty after just after a full moon. And so it had to be almost a full 28 days until the new moon cycle had become full again before they could exit. Don't ask me why. Just a religious teaching back in Athens. And so Socrates was basically in prison for a month. And Socrates' um, students were coming to him. One guy named Crito, not Critias, Crito, came to visit him. And I'm going to show you here in this little quick book here. Uh, can you guys see right here in this, uh, where is that? Can you see right there where it says Crito, right there? Ooh. Crito. That is a very, very short book, um, 20 pages long. Plato wrote it, and Crito goes to see Socrates in prison and says, Socrates, I've read this. It's, only, it's a very short book from Plato. Crito goes into prison and says to Socrates, Socrates, we got a boat. We've got the guard paid off. He's good. Get your stuff. We're going. We're leaving. And Socrates sits back and goes, He's not smoking, of course, this is me. Uh, he's going, I'm not leaving. If I run, I'm kind of admitting guilt. And I didn't tell those people to take over the city. I never preached violent revolution. The fact that they went crazy and let the people into the city, the Spartans into the city, and they took over, that's on them. I might not have liked Athenian democracy, but I wasn't preaching armed revolution. So Socrates was saying, I'm not running. I'm not going to run. And Crito was saying, you don't understand. This is an opportunity. They, you know, they're making it easy for you to escape. Just come with us. We'll go to another city where you're famous and you'll live and you'll live to see another day. And, and Socrates said, if I run, I'm going to look like I'm guilty and I'm not. So the 20, so there, he wasn't successful. Crito wasn't successful at, at getting Socrates to, to, to leave that day, even though it was possible for him to have left to slip away. But he wouldn't do it. And so the 28 days is complete. The month cycle comes over. The guards find him still there. He's like, I'm here. And I'm. so they made him drink hemlock, a poisonous plant. And it chokes him and it kills him. And there's famous paintings of Socrates kind of, you know, as a matter of fact, it's kind of like even on this page. But I'll show you a better painting where Socrates is kind of sitting here and, and holding up the cup in his hand. Tip up the cup. And... Uh, you know, drink up the poison and, you know, he, he dies. And of course, Plato seeing this thinks that this is just a huge, huge dark period of, of, uh, of Athens history. And, and it's just totally despondent and totally crushed that his mentor, his tutor, his trainer has come to such a terrible end. So I'm sorry that I ran on so long, but Socrates is a fascinating figure uh, because it, not only is his method in terms of trying to find these absolute definitions, that's interesting. Uh, it's, it's curious that all of this is happening during a very tumultuous time in Athenian history. The 26-year the war that's going on with Sparta, the Peloponnesian War. It's a fascinating period of history. Sparta's involved. Uh, you've got uh, aristocrats and you've got working class people and you've got democracy fighting against uh landed gentry aristocracy and the working class people are trying to get political power in Athens. It's a fascinating period of history. And right in the middle of that is this old man Socrates with uh, trying to search for absolute definitions and philosophy that we're still searching for today.